morning. Welcome to Trading R. I'm Reema Tendulkar. With me is Samara Abdi. Good morning, Samara. We're off from the early morning lows, but things have gotten a bit choppy for our markets in the last 30 minutes. That intraday chart of the Nifty and the Sensex will come up for you on your screen. Currently, we're down about a half a percent on the benchmark indices. Uh, the mid-cap index, though, is holding up in the green right now. By slim margin, but at least it's a green tick on the mid-cap index. It's the banks which are underperforming, not just today, in fact, for the week. So week to date, while the Nifty is down 2.2%, the Nifty Bank is down 3.9%. So there is that underperformance from many of these large-cap banks that you can see so far this week. And what's holding up on the gaining side are many of these pharmaceutical names. So there is the defensive tilt um, in the approach. Uh, Sun Pharma, Dr. Reddy's are amongst the big movers today. IT has been the best performing index this week. The Nifty IT index has rebounded nearly 2% as the rupee com continues to depreciate. So that's a positive. The Nifty IT index up half a percent today, but up 2% for the week so far. And buying is coming through once again in auto names ahead of the festive season. Actually, we're in the midst of the festive season. Um, so we'll get the auto sales numbers on Monday. Um, so that will give us a clearer picture of how the month gone by. But ahead of that, you can see buying coming through in M&M, Tata Motors, Aish Motors, all of them currently in the green. Hi. Hi, Reema. Morning. So let's tell you all that we have lined up for you today. The Nifty and Sensex pair some losses after a gap down opening. Financials and energy are taking a hit, uh, but the defensives are in the green. Midcaps fare a tad better. We'll be joined by Devang Mehta of Centrum Wealth Management to talk about the outlook for the market. On the corporate radar, Sri Renuka Sugars is set to sharply scale up their ethanol production to over 1,200 kiloliters per day by the end of this year. What will this mean in terms of their capacity utilization, etc.? We'll be joined by Atul Chaturvedi, the executive chairman of Sri Renuka Sugars, in just a short while. Torrent Pharma is a stock under pressure as the street believes they have acquired Curacio Healthcare at an expensive valuation. More details and analysis coming up in a bit. As the dollar continues to hold near its two-decade high and currencies of developed economies plumb to fresh lows, later on we'll put the spotlight on IT companies, their exposure to Europe and the UK and also explain the potential cross-currency impact on these companies. All of this and much more lined up over the next 60 minutes. Uh, let's invite the first corporate on trading hour then. Sri Renuka is joining in. The company is all set to scale up its ethanol production to 1,250 kiloliters per day by December this year versus 720 uh, kiloliters per day of capacity currently. Atul Chaturvedi, the executive chairman of Sri Renuka Sugars, is now joining us on the show. Now, Mr. Chaturvedi, morning and thanks so much for joining in. Uh, could you talk about uh, this um, expansion of your ethanol capacity? You were operating at 100% capacity utilization last year. With this incremental capacity, which is coming on board by December, what could be the utilization and what's the demand that you're seeing for ethanol? Well, so let me answer your second question first. The demand for ethanol is uh, sky's the limit as of today. The government of India wants something like about 10.16 billion liters of ethanol by 2025. And against that, they are only getting about 4 billion liters as of today, closer to 4 billion liters. So sky's the limit, <clears throat> and more so because the ramping up of the grain ethanol capacity in the country has probably not kept pace with the expansion as far as the sugar sector is concerned. So as far as the grain is concerned, the ethanol being supplied by the grain sector is only about 13% of the targeted uh, quantity. But sugar is doing all right. And uh, we at Renuka have been punting on uh, uh, ethanol going forward because it's not only green, it's uh, carbon neutral, it helps improve our cash flows. And that's the reason why we're expanding our current capacity from 720 KLPD kiloliters per day to about 1250. And our expanded capacity should come into play uh, during the current season itself. Uh, sometime in uh, December, we should be able to do. And that should probably mean that our diversion of sucrose will go up and we will be producing that much less sugar. Last year, we diverted about 200,000 tons, and this year, I think we should be in a position to divert more than 
250,000 tons of sucrose. So I think it's uh, uh, steps in the right direction and it should uh, bode well for uh, Renuka going forward. Uh, Mr. Chaturvedi, good morning. Thanks very much for joining in. Uh, so, uh, assuming that this new facility will also operate at 100% capacity, what will be uh, the contribution that you're looking to make uh, to the government? I mean, how much of this will flow to the government? And, you know, as of now, ethanol contributes 20%, right? You've already said you're going to scale it up to 30% uh, in terms of revenue contribution. Uh, could that be higher still? Quite possible. In fact, uh, uh, last year, last financial year, we supplied something close to about 15 crore or 15.5 crore liters to the government. And this year, we are on track to supply more than 20 crore liters, maybe closer to about 21 crore liters. And next year, we feel that we should be in a position to supply additional 5 crore liters. So, which means next year, we're talking in terms of looking at supplying something like 25 crore liters. And the reason behind this is that uh, uh, during the uh, crushing season, we will supply uh, cane juice ethanol. And once the season is over, so whatever molasses and bee molasses we would have stored, that will take care of our run during the off season. So I think uh, on an annualized basis, we should be able for the next two, three years, uh, uh, keep on pretty, uh, ramping up our uh, supplies by about 20, 25% per annum. Okay. Yep. Uh, since you will be contributing more to the government in terms of, uh, you know, the overall ethanol, uh, what is the current purchase price by the government? And is there scope or are there conversations that the purchase price will go up? Because if it does, it benefits you. Absolutely. In fact, the current price of the government is about 63.45 uh, per liter for uh, cane juice ethanol. And as an industry, we've been asking the government to ramp it up to about 69 or 69.50 uh, because as it is, the government has uh, increased the uh, FRP for sugar. So in line with that, I think they need to uh, expand the uh, price or increase the price of ethanol. And that would go a long way in uh, ramping up the capacity within the country much faster. In fact, one trouble which we see is that in northern India, where the sugar price is relatively higher compared to Maharashtra and Karnataka, the enthusiasm for ethanol may not be all that great. But once you jack up the price, I think they will all be, uh, fall in line and they will be more than keen to start diverting to. And that should cut down on our uh, sugar uh, requirement. So the ask is that you raise the um, you know ethanol purchase price to about 69, 69 and a half rupees per liter. But is the government going to agree? What has been the conversation with the government or their thinking? You've laid out the industry ask. No, they definitely are seized of the matter. But the trouble is with uh, inflation raising its ugly head uh, everywhere. Uh, they, they, it's still work in uh, process. But what we are telling the government is there is no subsidy involved because you are buying ethanol at 65 rupees or 63 rupees. But as a consumer, we are paying something like 110, 105 rupees for our petrol. So there is no subsidy involved. And as a matter of fact, government might actually be making some money. So there's no reason why they shouldn't part with a part of that money to the industry, which will make the health of the industry that much better. And I'm sure the government is seriously looking at this. Back from the government. And our association, ISMA, is already represented on this uh, account. When can we hear back from the government? Is there any timeline? You are in the press. You should know better. <laughs> if we did, we wouldn't have asked you, sir. <laughs> uh, uh, we, I'm sure it should come before the start of the crushing season sometime. In middle of October or second half of October, the crossing season, it ought to come before that. Okay. Uh, you said that the overall demand, I mean, the government wants about 10 billion liters of ethanol by 2025. The industry right now is producing only about 4 billion liters, right? You have some capacity expansion plans. Does it end at, uh, you know, I think 1250 kiloliters per day, or do you have another leg of expansion, a second expansion plan that you've lined up? 
No, we certainly would have a second leg of expansion because what we've, uh, we've taken the authority from our board to expand to about 1400 KL, uh, out of which we are first in the first phase going ahead till about 1250 KL. And in the second phase, uh, uh, we will go ahead with the balanced uh, expansion as well of 150 KL. So we are on track and I'm sure there's no reason why we would scale down our investment in the sector because it, uh, it, we feel it is the sunrise sector and okay. it has actually ensured that the sugar sector is no longer a sugar sector, it's energy sector now. One question about the second phase of expansion to 1500 kiloliters per day. Uh, what is the timeline and the investment from your end? It's not 1,500, it is 1,400. 1,400, okay. Additional 150 KL. Uh, we would be reviewing it uh, sometime uh, uh, after the season is over. Then we'll look at expanding, and, which is okay. post this financial year. Post this financial year, all right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chaturvedi, for joining in. That's Sri Renuka, hopeful of an increase in the ethanol purchase price by the government. They're betting big on it, but they're hopeful that they will get a higher price from the government. Uh, at, maybe we should hear it towards the end of October or early November. And they're also planning a second leg of expansion, a second phase of expansion in the ethanol production. Their current capacity is 720 kiloliters per day. In the first phase, they're going to expand it to 1250 kiloliters per day, but they also have plans to further increase it to 1400 kiloliters per day. We'll slip into a very short break on that note. We'll come back and tell you what's buzzing in the commodity space. Manisha Gupta joins us next. Hi, welcome back. You're watching Trading Hour. The focus now shifts to the commodity space. Manisha is here with us to talk about, well, what's moving. Manisha, morning. <laughs> morning, Zumana. Thank you so much for that. Well, you know what? I'm looking at commodities which have seen a decline for the month of September, for the quarter that is September. And until now, from January to now, we have seen a constant decline coming in for many of these commodities. Well, the strength in US dollar, which is trading at yet another 20-year highs, clearly has been one of the major reasons that you have seen many of these dollar-denominated commodities decline. And the other has been the aggressive rate hikes, which have fueled the concerns of recession going forward. So even as support supplies in many of these commodities are not uh, enough. The demand is something that continues to decline and that's weighing on many of these commodities. This year also has been the one that you have seen all-time highs, multi-year highs in many of those commodities. But from there, it has been a constant decline. So that's exactly what I'm taking you through right now on the highs of 2022 and the kind of decline that we are working with right now. So after hitting silver at almost $27, 33% of a decline is what we are working with right now. And in case of gold prices, for $50 of a decline or nearly 20% off is how we are trading. So it's a bear territory for both of those precious metals. It doesn't get better when you look at energy markets as well. So from 123 to nearly $77 a barrel is how crude is trading right now. And natural gas has seen a decline from $10 to nearly $7 right now, which is a 30% of a cut there as well. Take a look at the base metal prices, which have seen sharper cuts coming in. Actually, copper prices hit an all-time high of $10,800. From those kind of highs, we're trading at $7,200. In case of uh, dollar terms, from 5.02 to 3.3. So it has been a 35% of a cut there as well. Iron ore, zinc, nickel, we have seen anywhere between 35 to 47% of a cut coming in for all of these metal prices. Also, there are supply concerns, especially in zinc, nickel, we've seen a high of almost a lakh dollars that doesn't get registered on LME, by the way. These are soft commodities, whereas well, the inflation fears seem to be declining now. So for cotton, we've seen 43% off. Palm oil prices have declined almost to half right now and rubber prices are down by 27% as well. These are all the declines from 2022 highs and that's pretty much the case as we move ahead as well. So you have edible oil prices, soybean for one is 22% down. Wheat clearly there have been some concerns in the international markets is the reason it has fallen less than what others have done. Same is the case with rice. Remember for Indian markets as well we are looking at lower paddy sowing, lower availability of rice and is the reason the global markets have been reacting and just about 4% of a decline. So I think when you look at all the commodities, rice perhaps is the one that has declined the least and ma ma maximum major decline really coming in for the industrial metals right now.
Thank you very much for that. But other commodities are also falling. Look at the flash on your screen. Palm oil prices have fallen by 5%. They're now trading at the lowest level since January of 2021. Remember, palm oil is a key input into soaps, biscuits, noodles. So when the palm oil prices decline, there is a cut in raw material for companies like HUL, GCPL, that's Godrej Consumer Products, Britannia, Nestle. These would be the key beneficiaries. And the street would perhaps now pencil in an improvement in the gross margins, particularly in the second half of the year, if uh, the palm oil prices remain. In fact, the FMCG companies like HUL, ITC, which are very close to its 52-week highs, they've been the better performing stocks this year. The Nifty FMCG index is higher by nearly 18% on a year-to-date basis versus the Nifty, which is down about 2 to 3 odd percent. So there has been that outperformance, and a lot of it is predicated on the decline in agri-commodities. Um, in the last few months, which will benefit the margins. The alert today, as you can see on your screen, palm oil price is down 5% today, down 25% in the last one month. That's a very sharp fall that we've seen, and they are trading at the lowest level since January of 2021. Get into a break on that note. We'll come back and discuss market technicals. Mitesh Tucker of EarningsWave.com joins in to discuss his top trading bets. Welcome back. Let's uh, talk about the market technicals and find out where we're headed. Mitesh Thakkar of EarningsWave.com joins in for a quick technical analysis. Mitesh, your thoughts on the day so far and where are we headed and the trades that you recommend? Uh, good morning. The day isn't so bad. I think you know we've kind of recovered nicely uh, from the days low and now near the day, uh, you know, uh, near the day's high as the uh, trading point. I think uh, broadly, I've been looking at 16,750 as a support area. We got a low of around 16,825. And uh, I, I think that this bounce back will be temporary and not be giving any kind of a reversal. But uh, because we're already oversold, this could still take you to about 17,130, 150 to begin with. And in a good case scenario, even 17,250 on the upside. So uh, time to cover shots, explore some long uh, positions. We've been recommending pharma as a sector. I think you know a lot of stocks are giving breakouts over there. Explore some longs and keep a stop below 16,750. Uh, on the uh, even on the stock uh, long positions, we are still not going long on the index because I don't think it's a very convincing reversal, but it's just a pullback from the oversold levels, and you could see a one or maybe a two day kind of a pullback, which could, as I said earlier, take us back to about seventeen one fifty. Hi, Mitesh. Morning. So, what stocks are you looking to pick today? Yeah. So much, I have a buy on Asian paints, uh, apart from the fact that we had some pharma names earlier. Asian paints is something which hasn't fallen much in this correction and is now on the verge of breaking on the upside. Uh, that's a buy with a stop just below levels of 3470 for targets of 3600. And the other one is emphasis, uh, which is a conditional buy. I would want to see the stock get past levels of 2105. And we have we got a higher around 2100 today. So about that buy with a stop just below levels of 2075 for targets of around 2180. Mitesh, thank you very much for that. Let's move on and get you an important story. Sources tell CNBC TV 18, the Indastars board met earlier this week and some of its directors have flagged concerns over mounting dues from Vodafone Idea. Nimesh is here with that information. Nimesh. On the 26th of uh, September board meet, uh, the independent directors of Industrava have taken a very strong view uh, about the mounting dues from Vodafone Idea. Now, <clears throat> You know, the, 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 in a very strongly worded letter to, to Vodafone Idea, they've said that, you know, uh, uh, the, the service, there could be service closures on the non-payment of dues. And uh, they've, uh, they've, they're seeking for immediate repayment of all the past dues, as well as, uh, you know, regular payments henceforth. Now, uh, 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 you know, according to numbers, close to 7,000 crores is the outstanding due of Vodafone Idea towards Indus Tower. In fact, for the last many months, uh, Indus, uh, Vodafone Idea has been able to pay only 30, 40 to 50 percent of the regular dues, uh, for which now uh, the letter very clearly says that uh, for this month, they want at least 80 percent of the money to be released, and from November onwards, entire 100 percent of the monthly dues should be paid. Uh, uh, not, not only that, you know, they, it's, a, it's a very strong letter that, you know, going forward, if they're able, not able to repay the money, there could be serious threat on the, on the service closures as well on few sites. If you look at the quarter one number of Indus Tower and the management commentary as well, uh, the Indus Tower had actually made a pro doubtful uh, debt provision 
of 12 30 crores in quarter one and they have been uh, you know even in the con call they have said that one of the clients has been uh, delaying the payments as well so this is what uh, you know uh, it's a very serious letter which has been put out to Vodafone idea from Indus Java a couple of things to watch out going forward one uh, you know the big question is will the Vodafone idea promoters uh, infuse fresh capital into the company that's been a key key uh, you know key point uh, which everybody's been watching out for even for the government's uh, uh, you know uh, uh, spectrum needs to be converted into equity. Uh, there needs to be a, a f full commitment uh, or a strong commitment from the Vodafone I I idea promoters. That's not coming through. So there are there are a lot of question marks on uh, you know how and when uh, the the Vodafone idea promoters will put in money. But uh, c coming November, uh, the the letter very clearly indicates that if there is uh, if there is further delay and the payments are not made, there could be serious threat in terms of service closures uh, or non-payment of dues from Vodafone idea. Nimesh, thanks very much for all those details. Time for another quick break. Up next, we'll talk about the market fundamentals. Joining in will be Devang Mehta of Centrum Wealth Management. Stay tuned. Hi, welcome back. You're watching Trading Hour. And, you know, the big talking point continues to remain the dollar index, which is holding near two decade highs. And currencies of developed economies are uh, plumbing to fresh lows. So how have the currency moves impacted the IT industry? Rima has walked over to the big wall with a complete analysis. Rima. The rupee continues to hit record lows versus the dollar and it's now inching towards the 82 levels. Conventional wisdom tells us that rupee depreciation benefits the Indian IT companies. And that's true. The Nifty IT index has been the best performing index this week. So we're now going to explain how the movement of the rupee versus the dollar impacts the Indian companies. Now, if I'm earning $1 in USDs, earlier when I would convert it, I would get, say, 75 rupees or 80 rupees. But now when I convert, I will get 82 rupees. So straight away, that's an added benefit for my top line on conversion. It also benefits my margins as my operating costs do not move up in the same quantum as most of my staff is based in India. But there is another angle and it's called cross currency, which is caused by the near 5 to 6 percent appreciation of the euro GBP against the dollar. And this is going to take away part of the benefit of the INR depreciation on the margin. Now I'm here to tell you how this works. Now the Indian IT companies roughly get about 50 to 65 percent of their revenues from the United States, that is in US dollars. Now if you look at the individual companies, the highest exposure is that of HCL Tech at 65 percent, the least is Tech Mahindra at 50 percent, TCS stands at 55 while Infosys is nearly at 60 percent. Now with the INR between 81 and 82 rupees, we're looking at a sharp 3 percent quarter on quarter average depreciation for the Indian currency versus the US dollar. The rate that we typically look at is the average rate for the quarter. In Q1, the average rate was about 77 uh, rupees and 25 paise. It's now inching towards that 80 mark in the current quarter. 1% rupee depreciation is positive for the margins to the tune of about 25 to 35 basis points. So it's a significant benefit that Indian IT companies will get. But remember, the Indian IT companies also generate about 35 to 50 percent of their revenues in non-UST currency. Mostly it's from Europe and UK, the other two developed economies, but the other important currencies are yen, where TCS has an exposure, Australian dollar, the Canadian dollar. And these currencies have seen a very sharp fall against the US dollar. Now let me tell you how this works. Example, if I'm earning 100 euros worth of work, Earlier, when I would convert it back into U.S. dollars, I would get, uh, say, 102, 103 euros. But now when I convert it, I'm only going to get 98 U.S. dollars. So that's straight away a loss of about $5 worth of work, and that's called cross-currency. And this happens when the euro, GBP, and all the other currencies depreciate against the dollar. And this quarter, we are likely to see significant cross-currency headwinds, and this will take away part of the benefit of the INR depreciation. 
Yes, there will be a benefit of INR depreciation in the margins, which will reflect in the Q2 margins, but it will be partly eaten away by the cross-currency headwinds. The math is a bit complicated, you know. Uh, the, to understand the net benefit, it depends on what rate the revenue is booked, how much of the revenue comes in from each of the geographies, what percentage of it is hedged, what the hedge rates are. But the more point that we are driving at is that while optically the INR depreciation appears as a tailwind, cross-currency headwinds will ensure only a margin tailwind for the IT companies this quarter. All right, Rima, very, very well explained. Thanks very much. Okay, so let's put this to Devang Mehta of Centrum Wealth Management who joins in now. Hi, Devang. Uh, morning. A lot of people at one point uh, were thinking of IT as uh, a contra trade recently. Uh, what is your take on IT? Uh, you know, Rima has spoken about the cross-currency headwinds that are there now, you know, that being one piece of the puzzle. What else would you be looking for? Is it an investment opportunity? Good morning, uh, Sumaira. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, I actually, this was a wonderful analysis uh, uh, which which Rima had done, and I was just glued to the screens. Uh, uh, so most of the points uh, I do agree with uh, that uh, generally the people or the investor community feel that uh, I, INR depreciation or other uh, the dollar index rising. Uh, a lot of this uh, IT companies who derive their revenues from US uh, would tend to benefit. Uh, but uh, there are two things which which emerge. Uh, so of course, Rima talked about cross currency headwinds, which emerge out of uh, uh, the GBP as well as the, the pound, uh, the uh, GBP as well as the euro. How that uh, sort of has also depreciated against the dollar, and how that would affect uh, a sort of the uh, revenues that you get a little little bit of more revenues that you get from US is neutralized by what is happening uh, across Europe. So of course, uh, it's very important to look at the construct mix of how these companies derive their revenues. Uh, the second most important part is uh, the IT uh, companies were facing uh, was on the lateral hiring, was on the on the uh, sort of uh, how they had the bench strength as well as uh, how the margins would also get compromised when the demand scenario uh, across US and Europe uh, seems to be weak. And when we talk about a sort of slowdown and recession uh, uh, appearing in a lot of uh, European countries, if not US, uh, I think the demand would also sort of uh, get a little bit curtailed. Uh, though, as I said, most of these companies have corrected big time. The valuation adjustment for right from Infosys to TCS to even a Wipro and HCL tech have happened, and also the mid-cap IT companies have corrected. So my sense is most of the bad news seem to be in the price at this point. Uh, most of the currencies that would have uh, create, created havoc, uh, there would be a stop somewhere down the line in another one or two weeks. And I think the quarterly numbers just 10 to 15 days away with most of the IT companies. I think it's a good opportunity to sort of pick up this uh, companies in tranches. Mm. Uh, Devang, uh, morning. You know, the next talking point is going to be the festive demand. Uh, what is it that you've picked up in terms of the intensity of the demand? Urban was strong up until now. Rural was a bit muted. Has rural picked up ahead of this festive season? And if yes, uh, what is the best way to play it in terms of individual stocks? And would it be a tactical play or would it be an investment call also? Morning, Rima. Uh, I think clearly uh, what we need is uh, in this type of markets is something uh, where there is uh, quality as well as quantity of earnings which will come. Uh, uh, most importantly, as you rightly uh, talked about the demand scenario, uh, the urban consumption was sort of never questioned after after we came out of COVID lockdown. And what we are seeing across India, in fact, uh, also in the hinterland or the, or the rural parts of India, uh, I was traveling to a lot of parts in this last four or five weeks, uh, doing a lot of meetings. Uh, what I found is, one, uh, the consumer confidence, the client confidence regarding how Indian economy is shaping up has, has just uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, turned a corner in the way that everybody is sort of getting positive and such falls uh, will encourage people to get more and more positive. But coming back to the question about demand, uh, I've seen a lot of uh, tourism happening with a lot of vengeance, uh, revenge tourism, revenge travel, revenge shopping, revenge eating out. Uh, this is this was more a, a, a theory which was happening in urban India, but post good monsoon, uh, post I think uh, generally the, the rural India also seems to be coming back with the port. Uh, you hear to a lot of commentaries in the first quarter uh, about companies who are based on the discretionary consumption. All these companies were also talking uh, big time about high con how consumption is coming back, be it non-discretionary, be it discretionary, be it home improvement, building materials. Uh, the tier three and the tier four cities are also experiencing a good boom in terms of real estate sales as well as home improvement as well. So my sense is yes, demand is going to stay. Uh, yes, uh, if, if the terminal rate now when we talk about RBI is going to be at around 6.5, it needs to be seen that uh, on a higher interest rate, how a certain discretionary consumption would get probably delayed uh, or, or whether it gets cancelled. So that is one part which we'll closely observe over the uh, next two, three days. So, but my sense is demand right now seems to be good. 
people have come out of uh, lockdowns and I think this uh, uh, revenge tourism and revenge uh, uh, eating out and stuff and discretionary consumption consumption would sort of uh, continue for uh, for at least a, a quarter or two. Mm. No, uh, Devang, I agree with you because you know even I was reading a report which said that uh, the higher ticket uh, consumption is continuing. Uh, but there are some question marks on the lower ticket items, you know, the uh, spending appetite or the consumption appetite of, uh, you know, the lower income earners hasn't returned uh, to the same level as it was, uh, say, pre-pandemic. So, uh, given that, uh, you know, what would be the kind of stocks you would look at, I mean, considering that, uh, you know, uh, these lower ticket items are not moving as fast as one would have uh, hoped? In fact, Sumaira, uh, you hit the nail on the head, and in fact, that is what uh, we were talking about, uh, discretionary consumption, and discretionary consumption generally uh, comes in terms of uh, the higher uh, strata of the pyramid, where a lot of people right now have more disposable income, or people would have saved a lot of money in the pandemic. Of course, it, it will sound cliche, but uh, a lot of people who sort of delayed uh, uh, inevitably uh, their travel or their shopping uh, are now uh, shopping with a bit of vengeance. And, and that is why companies uh, uh, in the auto universe, right, Maruti, Aisha, just uh, uh, giving certain examples, all these companies had suffered in the last four, five years on the back of a lot of more uh, headwinds as well as uh, COVID uh, setting in. I think most of the people right now are getting into buy uh, not only a vehicle, but even a premium vehicle. Uh, you, you, you said rightly that higher ticket consumption is uh, sort of uh, the order of the day, which is seeing uh, good green shoots. And that is when I, I, I talk to a lot of builders or the real estate community, you find there is more demand for a 4 BHK than a, even a 2 or a 3 BHK in, in tier 1 city. So, yes, the discretionary consumption uh, stocks like Titan or even uh, the auto universe or something which, which is in the luxury segment, uh, all these companies would tend to do well. You look at the, uh, the sales of the electronic goods or the white goods or the consumer goods which are happening across uh, has just the uh, in, in just the uh, festive season which has just started. So my sense is just discretionary consumption should be one theme which one should uh, start uh, looking at very seriously in the portfolio. Okay, and finally, Devang, could you help us with some stock recommendations, the ones which look most attractive at the current juncture? So this wouldn't be uh, counted as recommendations, but some of the uh, portfolios uh, that, that we built, uh, uh, the, the construct of the portfolios has been, uh, over the last four, five years, uh, the tilt has been towards more of home improvement as a theme. Uh, some companies like Asian Paints, some companies like even uh, Acera Ceramics, uh, something like an Estral Poly in the, in the mid-cap uh, universe. Uh, These this are some of the cracks. Uh, this also fall part of the consumption universe, companies like Aisha, uh, something in the... Uh, agrochemical as well as specialty chemical universe. Uh, all this form part of the portfolio. And of course, we can't forget something in the BFSI. Uh, Bank Nifty has corrected by 8%. Uh, why not get into companies like uh, ICICI or a Kotak Bank or something like a Bajaj Pins, uh, where you get a proxy for NBFC uh, uh, holding in Bajaj Finance. And also, uh, uh, the holding, indirect holding into uh, the Bajaj Pins, uh, the Bajaj insurance companies, both general as well as life insurance. So I think uh, uh, this is a theme. If you, if you buy the certain sectors, uh, in the portfolio, probably the portfolio would do very well for the next 35 years. All right, Devang, thanks very much for dropping by and for speaking to us. We're going to take a very quick break, uh, but we'll catch up on what's happening on the market on the other side. Stay tuned. Hi, welcome back here with Trading Hour. Those are visuals coming in from the Tata Motors event that's ongoing. They've launched the EV variant of their popular hatchback, uh, Tata Tiago. And, uh, you know, this auto giant already leads the EV segment in the country with models like the Tata Nexon EV and the Tata Tigor EV. And this uh, Tata Tiago will, uh, EV will also become the first premium hatchback to be offered as an EV in India. So, interesting times. Absolutely. I just want to quickly uh, talk a bit more about the IT space because we've got a Morgan Stanley CIO survey for the current quarter. That's Q3 calendar year 2022. Morgan Stanley conducted the survey between the 6th of August and the 6th of September. And these are the key takeaways from the Morgan Stanley CIO survey. This is implications for IT companies because it gives you an indication of what the budgets are going to be for this year and likely for the next year. So point number one, the negative revisions to the 2022 budgets continue. IT services budgets have come down for the fourth consecutive quarter. For this year, 
CIOs now look at an expectation that the growth is going to be 2.6%, but this compares with 4.6% a year ago. The second uh, takeaway, the initial expectations for 2023 budget, that's next year's budget, also shows deceleration. The services growth is now seen at 2.2%, which compares with a 2.6% growth that they're anticipating for this year, which means next year's budget is going to be lower by 40 basis points. Thirdly, the vendors, that's the IT services companies' willingness to discount has also ticked up in this survey. So currently, 29% of the CIOs indicated that uh, vendors are far more willing to give discount, which compares with 26% in the prior quarter. So what are the key takeaways for the Indian IT space, according to Morgan Stanley? They're saying the current cycle of downward revisions to IT spending growth is showing some similarities to that of 2008, 2009. However, there is no data to suggest if the current down cycle will be as severe as that of 2008, 2009, when the downward revisions in spending growth continued for multiple quarters before finding a bottom. They said Accenture's FI24 revenue guidance does give you some indication of what, what growth is going to be for FI24 for the Indian IT vendors. But according to them, they expect the stocks to trade in a narrow range until clarity on 2023 budget emerges and margin pressures also subside. Well, that's uh, the update coming in from Morgan Stanley. Let's uh, get into a short break. As we do that, here is some important news for all our investors. You can now track the U.S. market actions real time on Money Control. Log on to the Money Control website, app, and stay informed about all that matters in the global markets. Welcome back. You're with Trading Hour and here's our special series, the CNBC TV 18 Weekender. My colleague Mangala Malu gets up close and personal with Titan's Managing Director CK Venkat Raman. So let's hear out a slice of that chat. Rakesh Junjunwala passed away. Do you have any story uh, of the time that you spent with him? You know, Rakesh was a, such a wonderful person also, apart from the legendary you know, wealth creator that he was. And uh, I've been to his uh, home multiple times and he has been such a fabulous uh, host there giving me the tastiest of mangoes, you know, from wherever he got them. And uh, even uh, in the most uh, challenging questions that he had asked us, it was always with respect to us as management. So. A lot of memories and really heartbroken. They still hold about 5 crore shares in the company, 5.05 crore shares. Has there been any word on the future of their holding? Actually, we are not really looking at that. Uh, like I had said in a recent uh, interview, Rakesh believed so much in the fundamentals of Titan Company. Right? And finally, his belief, you know, sort of proved right in the fun fundamentals of Titan Company continue to be as strong, if not stronger. So there is no reason for anything like what you're describing to happen at all, in my view. But we're certainly not in conversation of any such thing. It's uh, interesting that, you know, unfortunately, he didn't live to see the vision that he had for India and uh, for Titan as well, the vision that you guys have almost 60,000 crores in jewelry sales by FY27. You do all the maths together, comes to around uh, 70, 75,000 crores put all the verticals uh, together in terms of revenues. Is that the number which is... Uh... Obviously, you know, in the investor conference, the parts were there. Hmm. Uh, like we did say 10,000 crores MRP from uh, watches, 2.5x from jewelry, so much from Taner and all that. You add all that, it is so, taking yeah. us to the ballpark of that. So, so yeah. it's just that, the, like the 10,000 of watches, there is no 77,000 sitting in my head right. for me to confirm. No, That's I, I, I can understand That's that. Right. So, you know, what we want to know then is that at that level of scale, uh, you would have all the pieces in place and all the pieces in scale as well. So, what would the operating leverage come to be? And your margins currently are at the highest that we've seen at least in the last many quarters, if not history. So, what would they be then at that level? I would say that that scale represents uh, 
the potential to significantly improve our profitability. And you also entered the cost cutting program right before the pandemic happened and that helped you during the pandemic as well. How much of those synergies have been realized already? How much of that is yet to be realized? Uh, some of it continues. Uh, some of it was uh, situational which required was required for that uh, period. But what we have ended up achieving is the ownership of uh, profit and uh, balance sheet. And that is the backbone of our predictable continuing performance. Since you spoke about ownership of uh, the gross margins, the EBITDA margins among the employees, etc. What I wanted to understand is that Caraclean is going extremely fast. It's broken even and it's also contributing to the operational performance of the company very well. At that scale, are you tempted to buy more of Caraclean? Caraclean is actually a you know, fabulous decision that we took uh, you know, in 2015. Uh, but at 75% plus ownership, uh, you know, we are in a very comfortable position in any case. Yeah. And uh, Mithun and team and Titan management, some of us are also on the board of Carrot Lane. So we've worked so well together to capitalize on the synergies of this. So there is nothing like that at the moment to share. I gathered that you are a singer. You love Mohammad Rafi songs. Think at the pest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but now we're by the water. We have our feet dipped here. There is the sound of the water. You want to hum a couple of lines? Abhi na jao chhod kar ke dil abhi bhara nahi abhi na jao chhod kar Wow. Well, and that's exactly how we feel about this chat as well. Catch snippets of this conversation through the day today only on CNBC TV 18. And with that, we'll wind up on trading our stay tuned halftime report is up next.